2008, I was watching the opening ceremonies of the Olympics when they were being held in China. And one of the TV commentators mentioned that if every person in China ate the way Americans ate, that we would need five planet Earths in order to grow enough food to support them. And I was blown away at that statistic. I didn't know if it was totally accurate at the time, because it was in 2008, I was a brand new teacher, I had just become a mom, I didn't really have time to, to research that further. And so that, that statistic stayed in my head over the years thinking, wow, as an American, I must have a really large impact if that if every person in China alone ate like we did, we would need five planet Earths. That's crazy. I had no idea in 2008 that my food choices had such a large impact that every time I went to In-N-Out in order to double-double, that I was contributing to species extinction, the burning of the Amazon rainforest, climate change, and oceanic dead zones. I had no clue that our Earth had very limited resources. Um, it wasn't really on my radar as a young 25, 26 year old. And then in 2012, I began to teach environmental science. And environmental science, a major theme of that is population growth. So I started to think about that statement about five planet Earths being required in order to feed one country if they ate the way Americans ate. And I started to think about how all of humanity here on Earth is all connected. And so I started to think about our limited amount of space on Earth and the population growth that we're experiencing. Right now, our planet has 7.3 billion people on planet Earth. And every second, three people are added to our planet. And if we continue to use resources at this rate, what does that mean for the future and for sustainability? And it's not just that our population is growing. Scientists predict that our population will balance out hopefully around 10 billion people near 2050. Um, but in, in that time, it's how we're living and how we're using these Earth's resources that we really need to be mindful of. When we think about um, our food choices and how it relates to the amount of resources that we have on planet Earth, we think about how much meat we consume. And if we compare our current meat consumption to what it was in 1950, we find that the average person on Earth eats twice as much meat as we did in 1950. But if you look at the United States, each American in the United States is eating four times as much meat than we did in 1950. Well, in 1950, we only had 150 million Americans. Today, we're at 323 million Americans, eating four times as much meat as we used to. And in the United States, on average, we raise about 10 billion animals for that consumption. And that's an enormous amount of mouths to feed at top of feeding a population on Earth that's of over 7 billion people. And as we look at how we raise enough food to feed all of these animals and all of these people, we turn to grain. And if we look at the world's grain, it's mostly corn, soy, wheat, rice. And how we allocate this grain matters. So when we look at our, our crops, we give about 20% of our crops grown in the world goes towards biofuel. 46% uh, goes directly towards feeding humans. And that leaves about a third, 34% goes towards livestock. So you would guess, wow, if less than half is given directly to humans, we must have enough to support humanity as we are. And if you think about it, um, uh, actually not to think about it, but the UN did a study in 2012 that showed about a billion people are living food insecure in our world. A billion people are malnourished and undernourished. And when you look that even further, you see that six million children each year die of food insecurity, of starvation, of death. They die in their mother's arms from lack of food, lack of resources, lack of nutrients. And when you do the math for that, that works out to be about 11 children per minute are dying of starvation. So in the course of my 12 minute TED talk, 132 children are gonna die in their mother's arms from lack of food. So when, even though we grow enough grain on our planet to feed all of humanity, we are choosing to give a third of it to livestock, 20% of it to biofuel, and yet we still have people starving to death every five seconds. And this is at an Earth population of just 7.3. What is that going to look like as we approach 10 billion? With limited land, our Earth has only so many space. So now we get into, well, how are we raising this grain? And when we raise this grain, it's, it's plants. They do photosynthesis. They require carbon dioxide and water, but they also require nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen and phosphorus are two essential elements for living things. So what we do is we add nitrogen and we add phosphorus to our soil in the form of synthetic-based fertilizers. Now one of the unintended consequences of this 
is that nitrogen that's hanging out in our soil actually converts into a nitrous oxide. And this nitrous oxide is evaporating into our atmosphere. Now, nitrous oxide is 300 times more destructive as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And what that means is you could take one nitrous oxide, put it into our atmosphere, and check how much heat is trapped. That one nitrous oxide would be equivalent to 300 molecules of carbon dioxide. When you look at the leading causes of climate change, agriculture is the top third, or the top third, <laughs> the number three reason for climate change. Now, when we look at um, all that excess nitrogen and phosphorus on our farmlands, some of it is going to go into the plants. That's good. But the remaining nitrogen and phosphorus remains on the soil, and when it rains, it gets washed into our waterways. Now, if you think about all of the farmlands spread across the United States, this is an enormous amount of land. And as the waters um, collect the runoff from our farmlands, it funnels into the Mississippi. This is the Mississippi watershed, and all of these waters are going to enter into the Mississippi and flow into the Gulf of Mexico. So here you have this excess nitrogen and phosphorus that is flowing into our oceans and into our lakes. And now while it was nutrients for plants on land, it's also nutrients for organisms in our oceans. These organisms are photosynthetic organisms, phytoplankton and algae. So while we have this surplus of nitrogen and phosphorus in our oceans, the algae living here are going to start to benefit, are going to start to benefit from using up this nitrogen and phosphorus. Now we're going to have algal blooms. You can see these from space, huge green sections of our oceans. Once the nitrogen and phosphorus are consumed, the algae are going to start to die because now they've used up their, their resources. So then the algae are going to start to die and decomposers are going to benefit. Now you're going to have a growth in decomposers. So the decomposer population is going to start to increase. Now you might be thinking, okay, decomposers are small, no big deal. But the problem here is that decomposers consume oxygen. So while there's dissolved oxygen in our oceans, our decomposers are going to consume this oxygen. And when we look at the consequences, we've now created a dead zone. Our oceans, anytime you have a major river around the world entering into a large body of water, you experience a dead zone. It's called cultural eutrophication. And so now you have huge amounts of nutrients running off into the Gulf of Mexico. And now we have an area the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island combined. Nearly 6,500 square miles of ocean. That's a dead zone. There's not enough oxygen to support life. If you go down to the Gulf Coast and order seafood, that food was imported. It wasn't caught off the coast. Fish can't live here. Our fisheries have collapsed. And so when you look at the consequences of agriculture in our own land, in our own country, we have to think on a global level. Obviously, the amount of land that we have in the United States is limited, so we've decided to move on to more land to plant more crops. So we've moved into the world, and we see our forests. Our forests are the next to go, because we need more space to grow more food to feed a growing population. So when you look at forests around the world, since 1950, we've cut down over or about half of the world's forests. And I'm going to focus on right now is the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. The Amazon rainforest, actually tropical rainforests around the world, are home to about 50% of land species. Now what that means is all terrestrial species, plants and animals alike, 50% of land species are found in tropical rainforests. And so here we have the Amazon rainforest home to hundreds and hundreds of different species of life. And when I first started teaching environmental science, one of the statistics I came across early on was that deforestation was the leading cause of climate change. And I thought to myself, what? How is like cutting down trees the leading cause of climate change? I thought to myself, well, we use these trees and we cut them down and we use paper, make paper we make furniture, we build houses. We're taking away the trees that remove carbon dioxide, but how are we adding it? What I didn't realize at the time in 2012 is that we're not just removing the trees, but we're actually burning it. We're burning our rainforest at a rate of 40 to, 40 to 50 football fields per minute. We're destroying our Amazon rainforest in order to plant soybean crops. We're clearing our forest, we've already reduced it 20% in order to plant crops. Soy, and you might think, Shh, I don't need soy, that's for hippies. Uh, the soy is being fed to our livestock. So in actuality, we're clearing our forests, our Amazon rainforest, the number one cause of deforestation is to plant crops to feed our livestock. 
So every time you order a double-double from In-N-Out, you are contributing to the burning of the Amazon rainforest. Now to tie it into climate change a little bit more, let's talk about the carbon cycle. When we talk about the carbon cycle, plants are one of the main things that take carbon dioxide out of the air and they store it for long periods of time. Hundreds of years, the life of that tree. Now, when we burn this forest, our forests hold about a third of the world's carbon. What we're doing is we're directly releasing it back into our atmosphere. So the carbon is being released back into our atmosphere, even though it's been stored for hundreds of years. And this is how deforestation is the number one cause for greenhouse gases. So the next time you think about yourself as, oh, I'm just one person. How do I really have a large impact? I'm just sitting here making my food choices. There's a whole seven billion other people on planet Earth. I came across a uh, fortune cookie once that said, no snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible. So yeah, you are one person and you do make your own choices, but together collectively as Americans, we have a very large impact. And right now it's catastrophic. So we can take the same analogy and turn it into a positive. And we can have the same form of thought and say, well, I am just one person, but if I do something positive, together if everyone makes a slight change, that can also move us in the right direction. So for example, if every American, keep in mind, we make up only 5% of the world's population. But if every American chose to cut out meat from their diet just one day a week, one day a week you don't eat meat. You're not becoming vegan, you're not becoming vegetarian, just one day I say, oh, no meat today. That's equivalent to taking 30 to 40 million cars off the road for a year in terms of their greenhouse gases. So yes, we can all work together to make a difference. I really want to emphasize that you matter, your choices matter, and future generations are going to thank you for stepping up and taking action now while we still have time.